But here I just want to do a quick little overview of some of the structures of the GI tract. I'm um, going to concentrate mostly on the equine large intestine. Quickly on the liver, here we're looking at the parietal surface. The other surface is the visceral surface, remember that. So just like the bovine, the equine liver is not as lobated as what we saw in the dog, but it is slightly more lobated. Here we have a left lateral lobe, and of course if we have a left lateral lobe, we must also have a left medial lobe, which is very small. Remember the left side is always separated from the quadrate by the falciform ligament. So here we have the quadrate lobe. We don't have a gallbladder in the horse, but here is the right lobe. And just as in the bovine, the right and the caudate lobe kind of blend together. There's no real distinct portion of it, although we will see in the next image the caudate process of the caudate lobe very nicely. So here now we're looking at the right side of the horse. Here is the right kidney sitting right up against that caudate lobe of the liver. Here we see the caudate process of that. Here we have the descending duodenum suspended by the mesoduodenum. And here also is the epiploic foramen, which is our entrance into what? Right, the omental bursa. It's significant in the horse because on occasion a loop of small intestine will become entrapped in there and that's not a pretty picture. Moving to the stomach, we see that the stomach has a very large non-glandular portion of the stomach and then a glandular portion. I didn't label it here but the edge dividing the non-glandular from the glandular is the margo placatus, which basically means placated margin. Here we can see up in the pyloric region, it's going to have a very enlarged pyloric region, sometimes referred to as a sac or a saccasecus. We see a lot of larvae here. These are probably Gastrophilus intestinalis, botfly larva. And the Gastrophilus nasalis tend to be on the glandular portion, if I remember my parasitology. Okay, moving from the stomach, we move into the duodenum and we see this very large structure, the major duodenal papilla. Here we're going to see the pancreatic duct and the common hepatic duct emptying in the horse. Now the reason it's the common hepatic duct and not common bile duct is because there is once again no gallbladder. And the bovine upon the major duodenal papilla we're going to see just the common bile duct emptying here whereas the accessory pancreatic duct is going to empty on the lesser duodenal papilla. Okay, If we move around we are now looking from the left side and we see here the descending colon Here's our ascending duodenum coming over here. And you see that there's that mesentery between the descending colon and the ascending duodenum, just like we saw in the dog. That's the duodenocolic ligament or duodenocolic fold. Okay, and right at the end of that, the ascending duodenum becomes the jejunum. Okay, so we have lots and lots of jejunum. The jejunum gives rise to the ileum. The ilium then goes into the cecum. Over here on the right side, basically the base of the cecum, not basically the base, yeah, basically the base of the cecum is going to be sitting up here in the right paralumbar fossa. It will then curve kind of a comma shape down the abdominal wall with the apex closer to the xiphoid of the sternum. And then find the right ventral colon and the right dorsal colon, filling up most of the abdominal cavity here. If we go over to the left side, we likewise find the left ventral colon and the much thinner 
left dorsal colon. One thing you will notice is that the ventral colon is more sacculated, the dorsal colon less so. It is the ventral colon and the cecum where most of the fermentation process occurs. Now you can't see it real well here because of sagging of the viscera, but up in the left paralumbar fossa, generally we're going to see these two structures, one being the jejunum and the other being the descending colon. They're both going to have very long mesenteries, and so the key to differentiating the two is going to be that the descending colon has bands. I'll talk more about bands in a bit. As you see right there, one of the bands. And also we see sacculations generally in the descending colon as we are creating fecal balls there. Sometimes also we will find the pelvic flexure up in that left paralumbar fossa. Okay, so here we now have the GI tracts kind of laid out. You can see the jejunum here with its long mesentery. Here is the ilium. We know this is the ilium not only because it's going to go into the base of the cecum, but also because we have our ileocecal fold right here. It's a very much longer ileocecal fold, but that will help us define our ilium. Okay, so we said the ilium goes into the cecum. The apex, as I said, is pointing towards the head. Back up near the base, we will then go through a very small orifice into the right ventral colon. We will turn at the sternal flexure into the left ventral colon. And as I said, you can see the sacculations very well in the ventral colon. Okay, at the pelvic flexure, it then becomes the left dorsal colon. Notice how much more narrow the left dorsal colon is. And then at the diaphragmatic flexure, it then becomes the right dorsal colon. Just cranial to the cranial mesenteric artery, the dorsal colon is going to turn and go from right to left as the transverse colon and the transverse colon gives rise to the descending colon. Okay, now let's look at these considering the band structures as well as areas where we have common blockage occur. So here we've got a nice illustration here and the bands we're going to notice that we're going to have four on the cecum four on the ventral colon, both the right and the left ventral colon. I like to remember that these three structures are going to be sitting on the floor of the abdomen so that there is four on the floor. So four bands. Remember that at least one of these bands is always buried in mesentery. Okay, then we have the pelvic flexure and we go into the left dorsal. The left dorsal only has one and that's going to be hidden in the mesentery. But as we come around to the diaphragmatic flexure to become the right dorsal colon, notice how much wider the right dorsal colon is. And so we add two more bands to have three. So one way to remember that is Three rights make one left, so that we have three on the right dorsal colon, one on the left dorsal colon. See my illustration? We got three rights make a left turn. Okay, then when we go into the transverse colon, we reduce down to two, and then also in our descending colon, we are then reduced to two. These bands are important so that the surgeon, when he has an enlarged and displaced bowel, he can identify where he is at. Okay, we noticed that we have a narrowing at the pelvic flexure. We also have a narrowing at the transverse colon. Good place for blockage to occur. 
Here is an enterolith that I retrieved out of a transverse colon of a horse at necropsy. And so the cecal-colic orifice is an important place. Notice we're going from a very large cecum through a very small opening, probably about two to three centimeters wide into that right ventral colon. So there's a common place for blockage also at the pelvic flexure and then also at the transverse colon. Now one more thing before we're all through here is I want to go through the circulation and what they supply. So remember we have the celiac artery is the first unpaired artery caudal to the diaphragm and then very closely behind it going off at an angle is the cranial mesenteric artery. Here we can see the renal artery going into the kidney and then the much smaller more caudal caudal mesenteric artery. Make sure you trace out that caudal mesenteric artery to see that it does go to the descending colon. Okay. Remember the celiac artery is going to supply the stomach. It will also supply the esophagus. So in the case of the ruminant, it's going to supply the rumen, the reticulum, the omasum, and the abomasum. Okay. It supplies the liver and the spleen and the pancreas, principally that left lobe of the pancreas. Okay. And it also gets part of the proximal descending duodenum and the right lobe of the pancreas. Not all of the right lobe, but some of it. Okay. Because the cranial mesenteric artery is going to get the distal part of the right lobe of the pancreas, the distal part of the descending duodenum, the ascending duodenum, the jejunum, the ilium, the cecum, the ascending colon, the transverse colon, and just that proximal part of the descending colon. Okay. Obviously the renal artery gets the kidney, but the caudal mesenteric artery is going to get the descending colon and the cranial rectal artery. Okay. So this is important because if we have a blockage in one of these, the cranial mesenteric artery is most likely with strongulous larval migrations. It can cause a aneurysm in that cranial mesenteric artery and we can get some clots formed that become emboli that will block a segment of the intestine. So you need to know which ones are susceptible to that. Okay? And that's all I got with you. Bye.